amazing. I can see it's put a little spring in everyone's step. So let's stand up together. Yes, let's everyone stand. The front row is standing. The sides are standing. Let's all stand. Great. Um, we're going to sing an Easter hymn called The Strife is over. The battle is done. The victory of life is won. The song of triumph has begun. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Let's sing together. you're here today glad that you're here either with us on site or online what a wonderful time it is to worship the lord let's begin together alleluia christ is risen the lord is risen indeed alleluia let's pray together almighty god to you all hearts are open all desires known and from you no secrets are hid cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your holy spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to have a prayer for our children before they go to Sunday school. Heavenly Father, you sent your own Son into this world. We thank you for the life of the children of this parish entrusted to our care. Help us to remember that we are all your children, and so to love and nurture them, that they may attain to that full stature intended for them in your eternal kingdom. For the sake of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Children and teachers, you may be dismissed to Sunday school. As they go, let's pray one more prayer together before we worship in song. O God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now. If you haven't decided yet whether you're going to sing in a quiet voice or sing with your whole heart, go ahead and sing with your whole heart. It'll make the whole day better. Amen. Let's sing together.
Oh 
If somebody's here this morning, it's quite possible that someone in this room, even now, has a problem that only Jesus can solve. Something that's been on your mind, something that's on your heart, something that's in your life that only Jesus can solve. The good news is, is that Christ is here. So whatever that is, that can be taken care of today. You don't have to leave here as you arrived, because Christ is here, and if God did not spare His Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also give us all things? I want to take just one moment just to pause before we hear the Scriptures today and just ask you to go through the last seven days of your life, go through the last seven thoughts in your mind, and ask yourself, have I brought something that only a Savior can solve for me? And just begin to offer that up to the Lord now as we begin to hear His words and come to His table. Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts and open our minds. And give us faith to see not only our problems in their details, but you in your greatness. To see you in your love and in your mercy. Lord, and we ask that you would, by your Holy Spirit, draw near to your people, even now. Amen. You may be seated for the lessons. first lesson is taken from Acts chapter 3, verses 12 to 19. Peter addressed the people, You Israelites, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us, as though by our own power or piety we made him walk? God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified this servant, Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate. Though he had decided to release him, but you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have another given to you, and you kill the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name, his name, itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that has that is it has through him, Jesus has given him the specific help in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance as did also your ruler in the way God fulfilled what, what, what he has foretold through all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer, re repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. The next reading is Psalms, Psalms 4. Uh, it's a, we're going to be reading responsively. 
Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you people turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and see false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble and do not sin. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and, and trust in the Lord. Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when the rain will wind down. In peace I will lie down and sleep for you alone. to the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Today's reading from the Old Testament is from 1 John 3, 1 through 7. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world doesn't know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Please be seated. I want to start with uh, two apologies and a, a funny thing I heard. 
the first is, is I'm going to talk really fast. And the second is, is that I want to go over some things that are fairly foundational. And so if at the end of the sermon you say, he really talked fast, well, there's your apology. And if you say, I've heard all that before, well, then there's your apology. And so the other thing I wanted to say is, as in the middle of the sermon, I'm going to open up that, uh, that umbrella. If any of you are um, superstitious at all, I want to share with you something Marcy saw at a store, which I love. On a plaque, it said, I'm not superstitious, I'm just a little stitious. So, uh, so if you are a superstitious or a little stitious, um, it's going to be fine, and I'll put it down before we get to the end uh, of the sermon. So um, what I want us to talk about is being formed for the future and how the resurrection of Jesus Christ forms us, not only for now, but for the future. And if you think about it, and if you've got your Bible uh, with you, if we only had to read the very beginning and the very end of the Bible, what a wonderful, happy story it would be. In fact, if you've got your Bible, flip to Genesis chapter 1 and 2. It starts with nothing, and by the end of that second chapter, there's like, there's a couple, and they have this beautiful garden, and there's animals all around, and all that God says about the whole thing is, this is good, 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 good. Uh, that one thing is not good, now it's fixed because Eve is here. It's very good. And then if you flip all the way to the end of the book, Revelation 21 and 22, you'll find that that good beginning has turned into a great conclusion. And you'll notice that this wonderful thing, not only now is there a garden, not only are there, there animals, not only are there two people, but now there are people from every tribe and every nation. There are people that are streaming in and out of this magnificent city where God and heaven have connected with earth, never to be separated again. If only our lives could be as nice as that version of the Bible. In fact, maybe we could take a congregational vote and we'll all agree to just rip out those first two and those final two chapters, staple it together and say, this God is the life I'd like. Anybody interested? Has anyone had a week like those four chapters in the Bible? Like your week has gone from good to great with animals and lots of happy people and singing. Okay, anyone got that life? Most of us, our lives are somewhere between Genesis 3 and Revelation 19. And because there's so much Bible in between, because there's so much Bible that describes how this good beginning is not turned automatically into this great ending, it makes sense that we spend a lot of time trying to understand not only how to get back to as good as it once was, but even if we could just get that, we would be so relieved that we'd be content to just sit quietly until the rest of the clock runs out. Jesus describes to his disciples, he says, I have to tell you, this is what is written about. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms. This is what the apostles apply to us to try to help us understand that in the coming of Jesus Christ, Jesus remedies what went wrong in Genesis chapter 3 and following. Because it's not as though everyone sat quietly just waiting for their punishment or for a rescue. People still, still stay busy. Um, one person once said that most human development is the result of people being unable to sit quietly in a room by themselves. There's sort of that restlessness of human capacity and opportunity. In all of those things, we are so thankful that Jesus has come to rescue us and redeem us and to rehabilitate us that we are so thankful that Good Friday gives way to Easter Sunday that once we are back in the good graces of God and in the good graces of ourselves, we're back in our own right mind, redemption itself is such a reason to praise God for that we are content to sit quietly until life runs out. But Easter has more in store than that. As good as that is. And if you're here and you've never experienced the rescue or the redemption or the rehabilitation of Jesus returning you back to a relationship with God or returning you back to your true self, if you've never had that first part of a new relationship with Jesus Christ, I want you to ask every question you can think of because nothing is more important. But once Jesus Christ sets us back right with God and with one another and with ourselves, Easter tells us that we are being formed for the future. And one way you can see this is that God has this plan that's, in, that, that, that's evident even in these four chapters we looked at at the very beginning and very end of the book. Because one thing you'll notice is that at the beginning of the story, how many people are there? It's time for you to give answers. How many people are at the beginning of the story? 
two, two people, and they have very poor wardrobes, right? I mean, this, this is like, you know, it's sort of like when you just get married and you think like, we have no money, we have no really nice clothes to wear, but we're together, so it's really great, it's really wonderful. And so then at the end of the story, how many people are there? Lots greater than two, right? See, even I can do this kind of math. You start with two people, you end up with lots of people, because one of the fundamental ideas that goes through the Bible is this idea of increase. In fact, God tells the, the people, he tells not only the people, but he also tells creation, I want you to multiply and increase. This is why we have hundreds of breeds of dogs, right? That's why we have all that. That's why we have so many channels on cable television, right? That's why we have so many varieties of cereal, because things increase. They're meant to start here, but not stop there. They're to fill the sea and fill the air and fill the land and fill homes. This idea of increase is built into the story of Scripture. But along with this idea of increase, not just sort of quantitative increase, there's also this idea of development. That what starts here has inherent latent potential, and that potential, if given attention and, and drawn out of itself, this potential can become more than it was at the beginning. This is why parents help their children with homework. I mean, how many of you really love long division? How many of you really love the children that you help do long division? Right, it's the love of those children that you say, I'm going to invest in the present something for what I can envision for the future. This present moment is shaped not by what I see in the present moment, but by the vision of the future that I have because of that. Why do people start a new business? Because they just want, you know the, the joke, how do you become a millionaire in business? Start as a billionaire. Right? It's not just because people say, I'm restless and I'd like to spend all my money on risky ventures. No, it's because they say, I can see in this present moment challenges and opportunities that I think I can draw out of this present moment something that is more valuable and move towards a future that is preferable for me and for the people I love and for the people around. We live in Florida. Every other person is a developer, right? Every person sees an opportunity and grows it forward. What do you see in the, from the beginning? In the beginning, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, chapter 1 and 2, we see a garden. It's a paradise garden, but, you know, there's not even a shelter. I mean, it's just sort of like trees and things like that. It's, it's wonderful. What do you see at the end of the book? Revelation 21 and 22. What is the vision? What's the backdrop of it there? Is it just a garden? What else do you see? It's a city. And it's not just like... You know, as nice as it is, it's not just Castleberry and Winter Springs. It's like a ginormous metropolis of glory. It's where God lives. I mean, can you imagine the neighborhood and the property values in God's neighborhood? It's fantastic. It's the most beautiful place ever. And it says the nations stream in and out. Everybody wants to be there. There's the development of a good beginning to a great ending. And this development, this increase, these two threads that go through the story. Here's the beautiful part. What sin and death tried to stop and bring an end to by the redemption and saving work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to resist and to destroy the one who came to only steal, kill, and destroy. He came to stop that breakdown so that God's original good plan could continue increasing and developing until God's glory covers the surface of the earth like the waters cover the sea. And here's how Jesus does it. Jesus forms us for the future. Jesus forms us to move forward. Jesus gives us opportunity to not only watch him fulfill the story of Scripture, but in our redemption, Jesus brings us back into that story God is telling. And in fact, if you want to, to look at it, I'm going to ask you to flip uh, pages a little bit. If you look at that original commission, I'm going to read it quickly in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. It says, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. There's the, the increase idea, there's the, the development idea. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Cats are accepted because cats don't listen to anyone, but everything else you should bring up and develop and, and give leadership to. Jesus repeats this idea and develops it with the remedy of salvation built in in the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus begins by saying, 
saying, all authority is mine. He ends it by saying, I'm with you to the very end of the story. And then in the middle, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, because surely I am with you. Jesus here in the Great Commission is recommissioning his people to continue God's good story. How do we know that? Because increase takes place on two vectors. Increase takes place through time. Parents have children, and then parents are turned into grandparents as children have children of their own. You can increase the good story that God is telling you by passing on your faith through time. And here's the beautiful thing. It doesn't have to just be one generation at a time. Some of you are at a wonderful stage and season of life where you are actually able to skip generations and speak into the generation not immediately to you, but across from you. Some of you get to be like Alaska and Hawaii. You know, you're a non-contiguous generation. You can speak across a generation to help develop and continue the good story God is telling you. Some of our students have an opportunity to reach out and get to know older Christians in the faith, older people in the faith who can give them a head start or additional insight into what it's like to walk with God across a lifetime by not just talking to their parents, but by talking to wise elders around them and getting connected to people who've been through a few things, have seen a few things. You can reach across time, but you also reach across borders. This idea of developing from one family into tribes and nations. This is the idea that happens initially just in things increasing. Is how we go from one pair of dogs into all the kinds of dogs that there are. I bet if we were to go around and poll the parish right now, I bet we have at least 15 different breeds of dogs in, represented in this room. Right? Because God is generous. God gives good gifts. He does those things. But going across those borders also makes it possible for us to encounter and recognize and affirm the good gifts that God has given to all people. Jesus at the Great Commission does the same thing. What is it that he says to do? He says, make disciples out of every nation. Cross every border to share this good news. And once they're made disciples, what do you give them? The name that connects them back to the original family. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But it's not just that there's going to be more people, and here's where I'm going to crank the, the thing. My children helped me practice this the other day. They said, Daddy, as long as you hear a clicking sound, you're doing it right, okay? Because <laughs> it's not only that we want to set up more tent posts, it's not like the beginning of the day where the cabanas are all set out, but none, no one's in them. In addition to an increase in number, am I doing it right? Ah, there we go. And again, if any of you are suffering from superstition, it's okay. I'll be the first to be hit, right? Okay, so not only is there an idea of increase, not only are there supposed to be more tents along the beach, but each individual person is supposed to experience development. That what God put in them in their creation, in their good creation, even though sin and death and hell have tried to stunt or to thwart or to stop that, the promise is in resurrection that Jesus Christ will help people come to flower. How is it that we see that in the Great Commission? We see it when Jesus said, teach them to obey everything I have commanded. This following of Jesus and all the teachings that he gives us is what helps individuals become what they are meant to be by abandoning ways that are fruitless and futile and lead to frustration. Instead, you have the way of Jesus which opens up a whole life life that begins now and continues forever. In the Old Testament, there's this great phrase. I brought the stool just so I could remind you of this phrase. One of the images in the Old Testament to describe the kind of peace and prosperity, increase and in development that God had in mind is the image of every person sitting under their own vine. You know what's so beautiful about that image is that everybody would have this, this place, this goal, this sort of, that feeling you have when you're sitting in your chair and you look to the person with you and you say, you doing good? I'm doing good. We're doing good. You know that feeling when everything's going just right, where there's enough for me and there's enough for my neighbor next door, there's enough for the neighbor across the street, because the increase that God is giving gives opportunity for us to all give praise to God. The development that God is doing gives us a chance to know that whatever we're going through today is not the end of the story. Because the end of the story we've already read and Jesus Christ has won for us participation in the future. And because we are going to be part of that story at the end of all things, He forms us for the future now. 
He forms us so that when we get to the end of the story, we will feel right at home. So three things I want to share, and then I'm going to stop. The first is, how do we do this in terms of our relationship? Because development is not only the top of the ten. It's not only what you would do externally. It begins primarily in the Christian life with what goes on internally. We were dead, we're made alive. We're caught in darkness, we're brought into light. That we were ruled by our own passions, now we're given the Spirit of God. This internal development expresses itself in external development. And the way that we practice this increase is in the same way that we're baptized into the family name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The way we practice this internal development is we grow closer to God by loving God and closer to others by loving neighbor. Those are the two paths for development. If you want to grow into all God has in mind for you to be, then love God and love your neighbor and love the story that he's telling through the life of the church and in this world. I want us to look at Jesus because Jesus doesn't just herald this future. He brings it and gifts it to us. What is it that Jesus does? Jesus gives us a story that demands that our planning has to go beyond what's happening right now. Now, I know that uh, some of us have moments, I bet some of you had a moment just this past week where your prayer to God, you could have expressed it this way. Jesus, if you'll help me stay Christian for the next five minutes, I'd really appreciate it. I just need five minutes of grace, Lord. Just give me five minutes. Now, some of you have a longer track. Some of you say, Jesus, I need to be, I need your grace for the next five days. This is going to be a tough week. I need your grace to stay Christian, to stay true to you for the next five days. Some of you are planning for the next five months. Some of you are praying like that first five-minute prayer, praying for an instant. But some of you need to be planning to be part of what God is going to be doing for the next five decades. Because God's idea of development will fill the earth with glory which includes not only what we do in a moment, but what we do in a season, what we do in a lifetime, what we do through, what we do to prepare for the next generation to go further than we have gone. All this gift that Jesus gives us, he blows the door out of the end of this life into eternity, and he brings eternity into the present. And he says, you can start, as Bishop Carl taught us, to start working on your 500-year plan. And that 500-year plan, what are the dynamics of that? Love God, love your neighbor, love the story God is telling through his people. But Jesus doesn't only give us that vision. That can still sort of be up in the sky. Jesus gives us a concrete pattern. When he talks to the disciples, you notice this verse in verse 41. He says, while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement. Can you imagine having a soul that is filled with joy and amazement and doubt so stirred up you can't isolate which feeling you're having? That's why Jesus, in the midst of that, he's talking about the fulfillment of, old, of the whole Old Testament, the fulfillment of God's purposes for creation. And they are so confused that he says, do you have anything to eat? He brings it immediately down to the concrete. He brings it immediately down into something you can see and touch and know. Jesus gives us a pattern. Jesus gives us a pattern. Bishop Carl and I were in going to Ghana once, and we were taking uh, Mother Barbara and Tom with us, and we were at the airport in New York, and it was, such, it was the best idea. Bishop Carl had this great idea. Let's get them wheelchairs. It was wonderful. Now, if you put me in a room with a blank piece of paper and threatened to torture me and said, draw a map of the New York airport, I'd just take the torture. because There's no way I could create that. I would like draw some little airplanes and some runways and say, please, God, have mercy on me because I have no idea how it's laid out. But here's the beautiful thing. When the people with the wheelchairs came, I didn't have to know any of that. I just had to keep my eyes on the person pushing the chair. And what did they do? They led us straight through. They helped us cut past people. We went to the front of the line. We used side doors. It was wonderful. I felt a little guilty as we were passing all the people in the crowd, but not that long. I was mostly grateful. And, we just... and here's the thing I learned. You don't have to know anything if you trust the person you're following. You can be completely oblivious to what's going on. If someone says, how are you going to explain that? How are you going to make sense of that? I don't know, but I've got to stay in touch with them because they are my way. Jesus gives you a way. He gives you a way. He says, watch me. See my hands. See my feet. Touch me. Come and I'll feed you. I'll give you my name. Keep your eyes on me. 
And that same dynamic works whether you're trying to be Christian for the next, next five minutes or you want to be part of what God's going to do in the next 500 years. Whatever place you are, whether you're working on internal development or you're working on the relationships in your family or you're trying to reach your neighbor or you're trying to impact what's going on in your community or you're trying to right some injustice or you're trying to show more compassion, Jesus gives us not just thoughts to think, He gives us a pattern to follow. He gives us practices that we can join in so we can keep our eyes on Him so that we can love God, love neighbor, love the story God is telling through His people. And if you want to know what Jesus is about, how did Jesus bring this Easter reality into this life, then go back and read again the Beatitudes, where Jesus said God's kingdom is nigh. So blessing to you and blessing to you and blessing to you. Blessing when your life's going well. Blessing when your life has fallen apart because God's kingdom has drawn near. It is a time for increase and development and the presence of God. And if you want to know to come back and as I close to our 50th anniversary, Read Luke 4 again. What did Jesus say when he began his ministry to bring the announcement of God's kingdom? He promised, he said to the people, he said, Today I'm going to fulfill the scripture you've all been waiting for. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus comes to bring that jubilee message that if you're in a life and your life is becoming decreased rather than increased, then the Spirit of the Lord has been given to Jesus and now given to you so that you can experience release. If all you have are your debts, then it's good that you have a Savior who redeems. If all you have are losses, then it's good to have a Savior who brings the future of heaven into the present. Watch Jesus as he ministers. Jesus doesn't just do miraculous things that are one-offs. Jesus brings into a moment what the people of God have longed for for generations. God promised his people in the Old Testament, if you trust me and walk with me and depend on me, I will make your fields so abundant that you'll have bread for everyone. But Jesus finds thousands of people on a hillside with nothing to eat. So what does he do? He brings the power of the future into the present. He breaks bread and feeds 5,000. Jesus can do in a moment what generations before us have stumbled and staggered under. But Jesus does that in a moment, not so we'll sit back and wait for the story to run out so that we can say, I'd like to be part of the story you're telling through your people. Jesus, would you share some of that spirit poured out on you, on me? Would you pour out that spirit on us? Would you pour out that spirit in our day? Would you help us to keep our eyes on you? Would you help us be formed for the future? Next week, we're going to celebrate the baptism. Uh, Trevor and Devin are going to bring their daughter nec forward next week. And if you don't have any idea of saying, this is all very theoretical, I can't imagine uh, this idea of increase and development, then um, let them tell you the plans they've already made for their daughter. Go find someone uh, on, on, in the city square here who just opened their business. Say, tell me what you think about. What are your hopes for increase and development? And here's what I want to say. If, if those things are right, and they are right, for families to plan for the next generation, for people to plan for their businesses that they're investing their labor and their skills and their vocations into, isn't it right that disciples of Jesus ask the Lord to give us a vision for increase and a vision for for development, to be part of what God is going to do to make the end of the book so true that we can taste it now. Amen. Let's stand and profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father.
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. For the prayers of the people, let's take turns and lead out on the petitions and we'll respond together. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That your name may be glorified by all people. They may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. that they may be delivered from their distress. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into glory. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Hasten, O Father, the coming of thy kingdom, and grant that we, your servants who now live by faith, may with joy behold your Son at his coming in glorious majesty, even Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Amen. Let's confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Share with one another a sign of Christ's peace. We're going to share announcements at the end of the service. So, uh, so now as we prepare to come to the Lord's table, I want to welcome all of you who may be guests today. We're so glad that you're here. We'd love to say hello 
after the service. Ascribe to the Lord the honor to his name, bring offerings, and come into his courts. So we have a new song for you today. Um, this one is called The Jesus Way, and when you listen to it, I think the words might smack you in the face because um, it uses the technique from writing called antithesis, which is, um, you know, you say one thing and then you say the opposite of it. And that is because there is the way of the world and there is the way of Jesus, and they are very different. So this is about choosing the way of Jesus.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death. And by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and with archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy. Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, and the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say. Yeah. 
our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. Prayer ministers will be available.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you. Amen. Announcements. Uh, Marcy, if you'll come this way, I want to share uh, one coming up next Saturday is our wing night that's coming up. If you like to eat wings, if you like to compete over wings, if you'd like to come and be the judge of all the wings that are offered for consideration, this night is for you. In addition to the wings, we're also going to have game night. It's a chance to get together. It's part of our 50th anniversary celebration that we're doing all through this year. also want to put a couple of dates on your calendar. As already shared, next Sunday we have a baptism that we're looking forward to with great joy. The Sunday after that, um, our new bishop, David Saunders, will be with us for the service on that day, so come and meet Bishop David. That's the 28th of April. May 5th, Archbishop Emmanuel Collini will be with us. Um, so he is going to be here just to help us celebrate our 50th anniversary. If you've never had a chance to meet Archbish Archbishop Collini, um, you have uh, something to look forward to. Um, I saw in the news this past week that it's the 30th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide. Can you believe it's been 30 years since that occurred? Um, Archbishop Collini was the archbishop that came in immediately following that genocide and worked so hard not only to bring the church and the nation back together, but also to bring true reconciliation between the people who had been divided by that catastrophe. And so um, he'll be with us, uh, helping us celebrate our 50th anniversary, and we'd love for you to be here for those Sundays as they're coming up. Marcy. Just wanted to give a quick update on the women's conference, um, Friday and Saturday. Oh my goodness, it was amazing. We went to Atlanta and there were over 2,000 women there, um, worshiping, praying, praising, listening, learning, and hopefully obeying. That was the big takeaway is um, obeying what God gives you and walk into that service that he will provide for you to do it. Um, and I'm so happy to say the opportunity doesn't stop. We are going to be sending out a, um email this week for every woman in our church community from Alana all the way to Miss Alice. So that includes all of you, okay? <laughs> So be looking for that email. It's an amazing opportunity, and we want to share it with you. And next week, you'll hear from a few of the ladies who were there at the conference, and you'll see some of the pictures. Um, we took quite a few. And um, just want to make sure if you have any questions or if you have anything that you want to ask now before the email comes out, see me or Jaden Kelsey. We'll both be out on the patio, and she's helping me head this up. So I'm very excited about that. And again, if you're a guest this morning, we'd love to say hello right after the service. And so we'll be out on the patio with, uh, with snacks and hope you can stop by and say hello. Children, come forward.
came to fly.